expect that others will join us. That will be um, fine. So, first of all, um, let me welcome you to uh, this debate or discussion uh, after the G8. Uh, is it going to be G0 or a positive number? Uh, I hope the point of that is already obvious, and if not, it certainly will be by the end of this discussion, which is, of course, part of the Cultural Forum 2013, Global Citizenship. It's actually very relevant. Um, before starting, a few acknowledgements and an apology. Um, uh, obviously, above all, um, to Zameen, um, Sir Mark Moody Stewart, who is the chair of Zameen, and Michael Aminian, its founder, and I have to say, one of the most extraordinary social entrepreneurs I have ever met. Uh, persistent isn't the word. I, I told Michael a little while ago that over the last three months, he had succeeded in sending me more emails than any other person I know except my wife. And it was a pretty close thing. So extraordinary. I also want to thank... Um, on Zamin's behalf and ours, the Tate, um, Sir Nicholas Sorota, of course, the director, and Marco Daniel, head of public programs, and all the partners, Accenture, Africa Progress Panel, Barclays, SOAS, University of London, and Tate. Um, the apology, as you know, in the original program, and I was very much involved in persuading him to come, Trevor Manuel was going to be here. I think he very much wanted to be here. He had a number of things he was going to do here, in fact, today. Uh, but uh, political developments in South Africa, uh, and nothing, nothing to do um, with Mr Mandela, um, prevented him, basically, the president said that all ministers had to be back at home. And when the president of your country tells a minister what, that he has to do that, that's the end of it. So, unfortunately, he couldn't come, and it was um, last minute. Um, very happily, uh, uh, my good friend and colleague Gideon Rachman, at the end, uh, is going to pretend he's Trevor Manuel. I, <laughs> no, not... It is a great pity. It would have been wonderful to have had Trevor. He's a very uh, experienced and good man. Now, uh, on the topic, we're going to, basic, going to be talking about global governance and um, uh, the, uh, more broadly, in the context of the G8 meeting, as far as I'm concerned, the G8 is a sort of corpse. Uh, a zombie, perhaps better, uh, more or less moves, even though it is in fact dead. Uh, and uh, but there is a question of whether anything replaces it. Um, to discuss this, apart from Gideon, I have to my right Ian Bremer, who's a good friend of mine, founder and president of Eurasia Group, which is really is the world's leading global political risk research consulting firm. And he recently wrote a book called Every Nation for Itself, Winners and Losers in a G Zero World. I think it's clear what that means. And to his right is, of course, David Miliband, who was Labour MP uh, from 2001 till this year. Uh, he was Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs in, from 2007 to 2010, the youngest for 30 years. I suppose David Owen was even younger. Oh. Yes. Um, well, you are certainly going to go on to do greater things than that than he did. Um, <laughs> he is currently co- Three political parties, and <laughs> so the bar isn't that high, I think. It is. <laughs> that, that is indeed the point. <laughs> I, <laughs> I won't go further on this line, actually. He is currently co-chair of the Global Ocean Commission and will be president and CEO of the International Rescue Committee from September 2013. So uh, this is how we're going to proceed. We're going to have a discussion till about seven, uh, and then we're going to be open for questions um, to, from the audience. I would be very grateful if you could make them questions or if comments at least 
quite brief, really quite brief, because there are a lot of people, and I imagine you are all here because you're extraordinarily opinionated and therefore would like to express it, uh, your opinion. So uh, be polite to one another by controlling your urge to speak for 20 minutes telling us all how wrong we are. Um, what I thought we will do, we'll conduct this as a discussion. Um, I prefer it if we're all in sort of sitting in facing one another, but I will do my best from here. Uh, what the questions I want to th consider are, I want to go back to the basics, as it were. What does one want global governance arrangements for? What are, the, what are they actually supposed to provide? What are the public, global public goods we want global governance arrangements to provide? How far, that's my first big question, how far do changes in global relative power reduce or change our capacity to provide global governance? It's obvious to anyone that we are in the midst of huge transformations in the global economy, global relative power, uh, the extremely rapid decline of Western domination, uh, the uh, relatively fast growth pretty well of all regions of the emerging world, and particularly Asia, and that has enormous effects. And as that is shown, I think, in the area I'm going to be covered in my third discussion, this is the third question, which is the shift during the crisis in uh, late 2008 from the G7, G8 to the G20, which was, I think, a very important indicator of this transformation in relative power. Then here we had a, an enormous global financial crisis. One of the things one might imagine global governance arrangements are there to d deal with. And it was found, really, for the first time that the G7, G8, the old industrial countries were no longer able to deal with this satisfactorily, or at least that was the assumption, I think, correctly. So we moved to the G20. So, um, but linked to that, I think, is a broader question, which is, in the whole panoply of global governance arrangements, there are immense number of, of formal institutions. There's, of course, the United Nations. There are the specialized institutions of the United Nations. There are regional institutions. These Gs are rather a special sort of thing in that they are essentially informal gatherings of states, uh, mostly not all uh, more or less powerful, and of course all completely self-selecting. And so the question is, what role in the whole global system do this sort of grouping play? Um, then that gets me to my fourth issue, um, if we think about the sort of G structure, what determines the effectiveness and legitimacy of such groupings? Is it important that they be more or even less representative? What is their representative function? Should that be completely transformed? As I said, they're all self-selecting. Um, the G20, as far as I know, was invented by Larry Summers in the late 19. 90s. You might wonder what on earth was, what, what earthly reason should it be that the US Treasury Secretary 15, 13 years ago decided on this particular group of countries, and some of them are really quite arbitrary. Um, well, perhaps they all are. Uh, my fifth question relates to, I think, something that may interest a lot of you. We don't have to cover all this, all this, but these are the issues to me. Um, what about non-state actors? We're talking about states here. What role do non-state actors play in making global governance work? They, they are really, um, really uh, a big, um, a big set of issues here. And then finally, I hope we'll get to the, the sum up. Well. Can we, and if so, how can we make global governance more effective in delivering what we want from it, which is where we're going to start? So I'm going to start with Ian, and I'm going to ask you if you were to say, um, well, when we're talking about global governance arrangements, what actually can we reasonably expect these, these things, however they are? So we'll get later to how to structure it, if we can. What, if anything, can these sorts of bodies usefully do for us? Less. Um, look, I mean, we're sitting at the Tate. You've got a fissure running down the Great Hall here. I mean, I, it's hard to be more symbolic than that. Uh, I, I suppose I'm, I'm meant to be um, the provocateur uh, in the sense that I coined this term, the G-Zero, uh, 
not because I want a G0 or because I like a G0 or because I think it's a good thing for the world, I don't, um, but just because I think that global, I mean, G is supposed to kind of stand for global, not just governments, um, is, uh, is not really workable in this environment. Uh, what would we, you ask what, what sort of things would we like from our global governance? I don't know, we'd probably like global standards. We'd like a global internet. We'd like a well-regulated global free market. Uh, we'd like a global trade regime that gets stronger over time. We'd like some, I don't know, uh, certainly some baseline global security arrangements. Um, we'd, we'd like global uh, response on climate. Lots of things we'd like. Of course, things that we'd like aren't necessarily the things that lots of other people would like people that aren't from countries that are advanced in industrial and democracies. And, you know, I, I think these are structural issues. There are too many countries to coordinate well. So, yes, I think smaller numbers are easier to deal with. Um, a lot of these new countries that, that Larry and uh, that then Paul Martin, more, more recently with the actual G20 as the head of state structure, um, fostered on us are countries that are very different. They're poor. They have very different priorities. They have different political and economic systems. They're also much less capable, uh, less capable in their experience, less capable in how much lifting they can do in their diplomatic corps, um, all of that. Uh, our allies, America's allies, the Brits, focused a little bit on uh, your relationship with Europe right now, focused overwhelmingly on your domestic economy right now, and appropriately so. Japan, after 20 years plus of of uh, you know, lost decades is now finally getting their act together, we think, domestically in their economy, and appropriately so. The Europeans not perhaps dealing as effectively as we'd like um, with their existential crisis, but busy, distracted immensely. So, and then finally, the United States. The United States, uh, I don't, I'm not a declinist. Uh, I, I don't believe that the U.S. is in decline right now. I don't at all. I certainly don't believe the U.S. is in decline compared to the rest of the world. And I think there are lots of things we can discuss that bear that out. Uh, but the interest of the United States in playing a global leadership role is dramatically less than it was before. And you see this in Europe. You see this with the summit we just had with the Chinese this past weekend. Michelle Obama didn't show up, despite Xi Jinping's wife. I mean, let's face it, if this was on health care or getting Obama reelected, Michelle would have been there. Um, you know, it, it's just, it just shows priorities. It doesn't mean Obama's a bad guy. It just shows what the Americans want to do. In the Middle East, it's even more obvious, right? We see what's happening on Syria. Maybe now the United States might have a coordinating role in providing, um, in, in, in actually doing the infrastructure around providing military support, not actually giving the military support to the rebels. Maybe. We'll think about it if chemical weapons are used systematically, but not just once. Um, I mean, and if, if you think the U.S. doesn't want to do much in the Middle East right now, wait until... The energy revolution really hits. The U.S. hasn't even begun to stop being interested in the Middle East. We're really going to get there. Um, so I think for, for all of these reasons, it's, it's not that I think nothing is happening globally, and I'm sure that our other panelists will come up with many counter examples that show that global can work. Um, but, but the reality is it's, it's so much, so constrained structurally today from where it was. And so we need to be thinking at sub-Gs and at non-Gs as opposed to trying to figure out, you know, really how we can get our old G back. Okay, so basically, um, let me turn to you, David. Um, it's completely unworkable, given the current um, changes in the world. Uh, people are all inward-looking. Um, the uh, I distracted. The I get the picture. Uh, so, look, um, Ian is basically right. He's basically right that this is an age of extraordinary interdependence, yet it's an age of extraordinary undergovernance at the global level. And he's basically right, I think, to diagnose the shift in the balance of power. West and East, you talk much less about North-South um, in your article in The Statesman. You uh, talk about the Middle East, you talk about Japan. Um, you talk about Europe. I'd add Africa and what's going on in Africa as an important global shift. But uh, you're right to diagnose those shifts in the balance of power as being uh, very significant and as explaining why there isn't a, gl a hegemonic global power to keep order, 
which historically empires have uh, done. Uh, there isn't a balance of power yet because the emerging economies are not yet ready to be quote unquote superpowers. Remember, the worst thing that you can do in China is to call the Chinese a superpower. They call themselves a developing country. They will have one of the, I think, the 80th highest per capita income in the world when they become the world's largest economy. It's a very big change. They are going to be a poor superpower. It's never happened um, before. So I think he's right in his uh, diagnosis. But it's a bit dull if all I do is agree. So let me um, take a slightly different <coughs> perspective. If you're looking for a singular system of global governance, then G0 is right. But if you look not at a singular system of global governance, but at a number, which I'll come on to describe briefly in a minute, multiple systems of global governance, what you see is a messy, but in some ways overlapping set of systems. Some of them are regional, and some of them are strong, which the European Union is relatively strong. The Arab League or ASEAN is relatively weak. But there is, a, in, in this part of the world, a strong regional governance system. And in somewhere like Africa, I would predict it's going to grow in its strength. It's very interesting to me that in South America, uh, Peru, uh, Chile, uh, Colombia, and Mexico are creating something called the Pacific Alliance. It's got a GDP 20% greater than Brazil, so it counts as a brick, a, uh, a major emerging economy. They want to have the four freedoms of the European Union in a single currency. Um, so I think there's a regional aspect. There are also functional arrangements that are, it's important that we don't forget, I'm doing this Global Oceans Commission, the, the high seas where there's no national sovereignty involved are a terrible example of global undergovernance. It's the Wild West on the high seas. But there's another part of the world where there is no national sovereignty, Antarctica, which has a very strong treaty base from 1961 and has ensured that Antarctica has remained pretty virgin territory, preserved for humankind, um, without, without breach. Um, so you've got functional arrangements. You've also got some global public goods being protected. I mean, the most successful international treaty, I think, has been the non Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. It's under a lot of stress. But Kennedy, when he launched it in the 1960s, said by 1980, there'll be 20 countries with the wealth and the scientific know-how to become nuclear weapon states. They haven't, I would argue, in significant part because of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. So there is multi multilateralism under the surface. <coughs> Final point, which I think is the most interesting and difficult question, which is not quite the difference of values or the division of values between West and East or between democratic and undemocratic countries. There's another division which I think is more important, and that's about what are the rules for governing an interdependent world, a world of interdependent states and peoples rather than independent states. And this comes down to whether or not there are rights of the international system within countries, when the rights of people are abused or when the rights of the commons are abused. Uh, historically, obviously, um, dating back 350 years, the rule was what went on within your own country was your own business. But in an interdependent world, where there's a global consciousness about human rights or a global concern about the environment or security, that principle of national sovereignty isn't sufficient. And there are people in the West who argue it's not sufficient, people like me, who would say there are circumstances in which it's in which what, uh, what a country is doing to its own people demands an international response. There are circumstances in which what a country is doing globally demands a response. But equally, that's a very difficult, if you're in the US, that's a very hard message to sell. The, the US doesn't want to sign international treaties like the UN Convention and the Law of the Sea, even though it follows it, because it doesn't want to be fet have its sovereignty fettered. And obviously, the Chinese are, uh, are very concerned not to have any external interference in their internal affairs. And because of the danger of precedent, that's the principle they apply in uh, Syria at the moment. But so I think this question of what are, the, what are the principles for governing an interdependent world are the most difficult questions to answer because they call into question something very, very fundamental. I talk about an idea of responsible sovereignty, but we can get into that later. But I think that's really a hard nut to crack, and it underpins the greatest failings, which are to protect global public goods, which we all depend on. That's very good and helpful, and also uh, pleasingly different, so thank you. Um, so where do you come out on this, uh, um, uh, Gideon? Um, is there more going on than Ian suggests, or not? I thought it was very interesting listening to, to David, because it's quite 
easy, it's almost part of the job as a journalist to be a professional sceptic and say, look, it's all falling apart, nothing's working. And it is good to be reminded that uh, there are organisations that are doing real work and some problems that are actually being addressed and all of that. Um, that said, I mean, I think that Ian's basic argument that we're in a period of, of lack of international governance is correct. I, I personally wouldn't focus too much on the various Gs, the G20s, the G8s, and so on. I don't think they ever really were the things that, that provided global order. I mean, it seems to me that, essentially, uh, if you look back even 20 years, it was a American leadership that was, that was really crucial behind the scenes. Of course, the, the G7 or 8 would meet, but, it, but the fact that the US was giving a lead was... was Critical. I mean, actually, to the formation of the big international institutions in the late 1940s, the Bretton Woods institutions, America clearly forced the pace there. But then, if you think back, say, to the 1990s, a big economic crisis and a big political crisis, uh, when Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait, it's America that pulls the coalition together and, uh, and essentially leads the international effort to re reverse that, albeit with Mrs. Thatcher kind of nudging George Bush in the ribs. Uh, and then in the financial crisis uh, that hits Russia and, and Asia in 97, 98, there's this famous Time magazine cover about the people who try to fix it called The Committee to Save the World. And they're all Americans. They're, you know, it's, it's Summers and Rubin and, and so on. Uh, and now sort of come forward to, to our present day, um, there was you know, a fairly effective G20 effort to stave off the worst of the financial crisis in 2009. But then with the euro crisis, although the Americans are trying to kind of prod the Europeans to do things that they regard as, as necessary and so on, in the end, it's kind of a, it's, it's Europe on its own with a bit of the IMF. The Americans don't have the power, or frankly the money anymore, to, to leverage the solution it, there. And then the great political crisis of our day, what's going on in the Middle East, uh, a mixture of the Americans being unwilling and unable to take the lead uh, over Syria. And so you've got to sign a kind of absence of, of leadership. The Chinese certainly aren't going to do it. I mean, they, they believe that the Americans made a hideous mistake sapping their own power by getting too involved in the Middle East, and they're determined not to, to make that mistake again. And, um, and a final word on Syria. I mean, David mentioned this idea that one of the things that's happened in, over the last decade is we've had an expanded idea of what global governance might mean and the development of this idea of the responsibility to protect, the idea that sovereignty is not inviolable, there are certain things that a government can't do to its own people. But I, I fear that uh, what we're seeing in Syria is that that might have been a very short-lived idea because, in fact, nobody is able or uh, willing to intervene to stop what is a, a pretty terrible humanitarian situation. And so maybe you needed for the responsibility to protect to actually kick in the Americans still to have the power, or at least the big stick in the background, the sense that, they, well, maybe they might come in militarily. I think with that idea sort of written off, even diplomacy becomes much harder. I'd like to, before we go into some of the... I'd be very interested to tease out what you think, um, turn to you, Ian, actually, first, about... Uh, um, the role of China in the U.S., particularly as um, um, the a rising power on the one hand and established power on the other. Uh, I, I, I have to tell you that when I hear an American say I'm not a declinist, I say, well, of course not. I mean, you wouldn't be allowed back into the country. Oh, there are a lot of declinists uh, in the U.S. right now. Okay. <laughs> not many, actually. Uh, and you probably can put them all in a room. Yeah, uh, but anyway, the... Someone work for the FT. Uh, the, the, then, <laughs> then they're only temporarily in the U.S. Uh, the, the, start with China. Um, what do you think its role in this context is and is likely to be? Um, and what effect does its clearly um, rising weight, certainly in the world economy, have? So this brings me back to a little of what David said, um, because, of course, of all of the pieces that are now moving, right, G0 implies a lot of geopolitics are in play, and the Middle East is exploding, and Europe is muddling through. The big, the big piece that's in play, of course, Africa is becoming extremely interesting and will become much more important in terms of governance, not just in terms of growth. But China's rise is, is not just the most important. It's by far the most important. The fact it doesn't feel that way in the U.S. right now because the U.S. doesn't want to deal with it um, doesn't make it less true. Now, I thought it was interesting that 
David, many of the examples that you gave of places where governance is working are happy examples. The Antarctic is a happy example. We've got penguins there. We want governance in the Antarctic. Um, the regional examples you gave, right? I mean, you know, certainly I would add the Trans-Pacific Partnership to that. It's a happy example. There is governance that's happening, of course, that from the Western perspective is less happy. And that is a lot of the bilateral coordination that you see between the Chinese and other countries um, around the world um, that um, is going to make some of the regional and Western governance more problematic. I think one of the things that's really interesting about China is that they, they're not about block building. They're not about creating a large, you know, sort of uh, multilateral organization that they are the hub of. They are really interested in a whole bunch of bilateral engagements that redound certainly to their benefit, but hopefully from their perspective to both countries' benefits. And, and they'll be bigger than each of the countries that they're engaging bilaterally with. When Xi Jinping just made his first trip outside to Russia and then to a number of African states, he made it very clear, oh, we, we, don't, we don't have any political strings when we invest. We have, he didn't say what strings they do have, which are very important economic strings, but they have bilateral economic strings. It's a very different kind of governance. I think it's interesting that China is clearly trying to jettison some of their, even though we're a poor country, jettisoning some of their non-intervention. You see this with the peace plan, two-page peace plan they came up with for Syria. You see this with them offering to engage on Israel-Palestinian talks, which is a great place to practice because you can do different things for 10 years and it doesn't really matter. Um, so, um, you know, I, 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 I do think that there's movement um, on China. But fundamentally, um, the, if you think the U.S. is focused domestically, the Chinese are much, much more so. Uh, foreign policy plays much less of a role in their international focus than just ensuring they have the economic ties that allow them to have the commodities and, and access to other, other, other critical economic pieces to allow their, econ their, their politics to stay stable. And I, I, don't, I think as a consequence, the willingness of the Chinese to engage in whether you call it responsible sovereignty or responsible stakeholdership, the American manifestation of that um, concept is, is virtually zero. Um, and, and the likelihood is that the U.S.-China relationship is going to become more troubles, troublesome before it becomes less so. Before we get to that issue and some of the others, I'd, I'd be interested, David, in your perception of, uh, of China in particular and its likely role, the discussions you presumably had when you uh, were in office. By the way, I should say, uh, as a small correction, the first time I heard China referred to as a superpower was by a senior official of the Chinese embassy in London in 2006 at a lunch, which I've never forgotten. I don't know whether you were, no, Gideon wouldn't have been there at the FT. Anyway, he, he, and he didn't refer to China as a superpower. He referred to the US as the other superpower. <laughs> I thought that was wonderful. Uh, and it, so they're not as bashful as you think. Uh, the, look, David. There's a couple of things. First of all, the Chinese focus must be internal because they've got huge challenges to uh, maintain stability, to develop some kind of balance within their um, urban and rural, divided urban and rural populations. Ian's definitely right that their external engagement is very instrumentalist. They're not trying to create more Confucians, they're trying to find partners for uh, the development of their own country. And that leads me to think um, a couple of things. First of all, I think that we've got to divide the economic agenda from the wider foreign policy agenda. Uh, China uh, has, uh, on most foreign policy issues, been more of a veto power than a propositional power. It's been more likely to line up with the Russians to say no to ideas than it has been to propose them. I think in most areas of foreign policy that will remain the case. <coughs> However, secondly, precisely because of their domestic economic needs, I think it is possible to see that, and, and we know that there are people in Beijing and elsewhere in China who are arguing for a more activist international economic engagement. And so one has to divide, I think, the economic instrumentalism that will drive multilateral engagement on the economic front from the, um, from the foreign policy. When I was uh, in China two years ago, uh, 
So before, just as the current leadership team were being sort of manoeuvred into position, there was a pretty explicit talk about engaging more proactively on G20 questions because that was a place where they could advance economic, an economic agenda that was in their own interests. I think the weakness of the G20 is, 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 has probably disappointed them uh, pretty substantially. Just one other point which um, Gideon and you, well, all of you will have views on is more of a sort of psychological question. This generation of Chinese leaders, or at least the two people at the top of it, um, are the first generation of Chinese leaders who've lived more than half their lives since China started reforming and opening up in 1978. I think he's 54, Xi Jinping, um, so you can, you can do the maths. And I think that that cannot... So the question is, does that affect them at all? Does that have any impact on the way they view the world? It seems to me hard to maintain the position that will have no impact on the way they view the world. It, it, it's not that they send their kids to Harvard or that they went to Ohio, Iowa State University or whatever it was that he did in 1984. But I think that a consciousness of the world beyond is hardwired into them in a way that it hasn't been for previous generations who had to learn about it. And so my instinct is that this will produce um, a comfort level, not just for the kind of informality that you saw last weekend, but eventually for the kind of multilateralism that will speak to Chinese interests. And they will do it in a very hard-headed way. But I think if you look across the economic domain I've mentioned, climate change, the massive issue in uh, China, I, I, I see a, a willingness or an openness to a greater uh, engagement internationally. And I think that the psychological aspect of the lack of fear of the outside world would be another way of putting it, uh, I think is, uh, is relevant. Gideon, on China. Yeah, I mean, I'd be, I think it would be nice uh, if, if David is right and that this is a more confident and more internationalist generation in China. I mean, I wouldn't claim to know these people firsthand. I, what I would say is that the Americans I know who were dealing with them uh, recently believe that, you know, China, big country, has many schools of thought, but that the liberal internationalists are actually on the retreat and that you're getting more of a kind of military accent to the people in power in Beijing. And I think that... Uh, that's what made the Obama-Xi Jinping <coughs> summit so, it's so interesting because it comes at a very tense moment, uh, a moment when I think both sides are conscious that they're in danger of sliding into a much more openly adversarial relationship. And in a way, it's an interesting, almost theoretical thing. Can two leaders, who I believe probably are quite committed to the idea that we better get on because it's dangerous if we don't, is, are they powerful enough to... And if they establish a decent relationship, is that enough? to counteract the structural forces that might now be pushing China and the US towards a more adversarial relationship. I would like to believe so, but I, I suspect probably the structural forces will prove more powerful, and those are the shift in economic power, uh, the sense which was led to a shift in mood in both capitals, so that I think that in Washington post-financial crisis, a lot of the kind of breezy confidence that, well, globalization will sort of take care of China's rise, they'll, they'll sort of, uh, they'll kind of adjust to the global system and they'll be an easier partner, they'll probably democratize and it'll all be fine. I think that suddenly America can see, well, maybe China will become the world's largest economy at a point where it's still a one-party state. Uh, China's military spending is, is going up very rapidly. The US is more conscious of its own financial constraints. So America is more wary of the rise of China. And, and conversely, I think the Chinese do sense a kind of shift in power, and maybe that is why they've been behaving in a more assertive way in their own neighborhood, that the old kind of Deng Xiaoping philosophy about bide your time, etc., seems to have given way to something a bit more assertive vis-a-vis -vis India, vis-a-vis -vis Vietnam, vis-a-vis -vis Japan. And uh, America responds to that then by trying to build up its own network of alliances within Asia. So there are these kind of forces that are um, pushing towards a more adversarial relationship. And, and the big question, really, of the next two years is can Obama and Xi call a halt to that and reestablish a more uh, friendly and cooperative relationship? David, Look, do you want to... Go I want to ask it. a question to, uh, outside the world I know, to the world that the three of you know, better, which is so moving from government to economics. And I wonder if there is a structural, one structural force pushing in the other direction, which is the internationalization of Chinese entrepreneurs, the internationalization of the Chinese wealth creating base. I'd just be interested in what you think the implications are of, the, of this word global in economic integration. 
because it, it is the case that the Chinese economy is much more closely integrated into the global economy, not just macroeconomically, but also in the way that it produces goods and services. I thought you were going to take my point, and you didn't. Um, uh, because, no, because it's, it's close, though, which is that I actually think there is something significant that actually is the counterweight to Gideon's concern. I agree with Gideon's concerns, but I think there is a market counterweight. And that counterweight is that the Chinese are incredibly pragmatic about finding good places to put their money. And the private sector absolutely sees that. Smithfield, the $4.7 billion announcement of this, the, the largest, it would be the largest takeover of an American firm by a Chinese firm in history, announced a week before the summit. And clearly the timing was coordinated in advance because it's not strategic and it'll be allowed through by Congress and all of that. Um, but the reason Smithfield happened wasn't because Xi Jinping said, go, go do this. It's because you've got folks in the private sector in China that say, if I've got to park five billion bucks someplace, having access to a decent American company and their distribution with U.S. demographics doing pretty well and the economy picking up, that looks better than it did a few years ago. They just bought a American uh, movie cinemas, AMC. Same thing, right? So I, I think that is a significant counterweight, and it helps. It would be better if the folks in the private sector were more significant than they are presently, and the SOEs, the state-owned enterprise board, is important. Now, the response to your question, I think the answer is yes, that is a counterweight, but unfortunately it's a small one. Because if you ask me right now, um, looking at where the economic you know, sort of strengths are in China, who is, wh which one of them, how many of them are actually moving towards true internationalization and how many are doubling down on using their legal system, using the attractiveness of their market to get trade secrets, using cyber to pick up as much information as they can, using their state capitalist system to continue to claw advantages that otherwise would not redound to a country that is not innovating well, still doesn't educate well, still doesn't have a lot of entrepreneurship. I think that in 10 or 20 years time, the factor that you mention might well be one of the most significant reasons for hope that we could eventually move towards G2 or G something broader. But I, I think right now, uh, you know, the fact is, I don't think it's just that Americans are, learn, are starting to learn that when China becomes the number one economy, they'll still be poor. I think it's a, it's a fact. Mm. They'll still be state capitalists. They might be more strongly state capitalists. And, and that, for me, is, is one of the biggest dangers. I'd like to turn then in this part, because these clearly are going to be the central players in the world as states, um, to the US. The US has gone through um, some really quite extraordinary rapid mood shape swings in the last 15 years or so. And so, uh, not very long ago, they seem to be determined to remake the entire Middle East uh, uh, by force, some of us thought was a fairly crazy venture. I don't know why I put fairly. Uh, uh, and, uh, and now the US seems to be uh, in fairly complete withdrawal from all such engagements, um, as we have seen in a number of uh, events um, recently, including, of course, Syria. Uh, so let's think about the next 10 years or so, Ian. Um, where do you think the U.S. is going to go as a global player? Um, What's it going to be after? I, I worry that the politicization of and the demonization of China as it gets larger and doesn't bend to American will is going to get greater. The Americans are great exceptionalists, as you know. Um, we think our values are the right values. You've had a lot of experience with that here, of course, with folks like Tony Blair. Uh, but no nonetheless, uh, it is not helpful um, when you are kind of forcing it down folks' throats. And I mean, let's face it. I mean, the U.S. being exceptionalist and then having this NSA issue blow up on them the day before Xi Jinping shows up in California to talk about cybersecurity is probably really not the best that could have happened. I thought um, it was rather amusing. Yeah, well, no, it was from an external perspective, from an American perspective that wishes we could get our act together on you on China. It was like, here, we're finally doing a meeting and, you know. Um, look, it's not as if the U.S. has given up on international. Uh, Obama did spend three days in Israel, of course, um, and, and they have seven million people, uh, which, I mean, no, if, you, if you do the math, 1.3 billion in China, that's a year and a half in China, right? I mean, which is, <laughs> which is not going to happen. Um, I, 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 the United States is going to be attractive as a destination for investments. It's going to be really attractive. Uh, a lot of, even though the, the governance, may, you may think it's poor, 
they're going to do immigration policy, not because the Republicans are good guys or the Democrats are good guys, but because demographics have changed and they want to get elected. Um, the energy policy is pretty promising from a market perspective. Trade policy is pretty promising from an internationalist perspective. There's a possibility on tax policy as well, and we don't want to get into that. Um, so a lot's moving in the U.S. right now. And I think for the next, I mean, certainly fi five years, I think the focus in the U.S. is going to be much more on that. The U.S. is going to work really, really hard not to get sucked in to stay in Afghanistan. Um, the U.S. is going to work really, really hard, even though it has this huge military, um, to try to ensure the Japanese don't do nuts vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese that would uh, engage the U.S. in a more proactive way. So I, I, I don't see a lot of, of sudden shift, um, you know, again, barring, barring the kind of black swans that, that we hate worrying about, like North Korea implodes, and the U.S. and China are high alert and we don't trust each other. Or, you know, sort of there's some sudden major market implosion in Europe that forces the U.S. I mean, clearly, f looking into the abyss could bring the G20 together again, could bring the U.S. and China together again. But that's not the outcome we're hoping for. And barring that, I, I think the U.S., you're, you're, seeing, you're going to see a lot more of the U.S. you presently have than the one that we experienced on, under W for a few years. Um, how do you see it, David, the, the U.S. as a leader? On the um, geopolitical front? Or, oh, or, or more broadly, because I want then to get to, the, that, look, on the basis of what you say... Technologically, culturally, um, America is a remarkable uh, machine of innovation and uh, dynamism. The energy equation that's been mentioned, I think, is important. Um, I think the big, the, the hard question, the hardest question for American policymakers and for the rest of us who have to take our cue from that is about uh, the, 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 what they're pivoting away from. There's a famous pivot now to Asia, um, and, and that means the Middle East, because as America is uh, pivoting to Asia, Russia is pivoting into the Middle East, and you can see that in the Syria crisis. Now, what we're seeing in Syria is that while there are massive risks to interventionism or intervention, there are big risks to non-intervention as well. And the humanitarian one is obvious, and it's the world I'm moving into. In September, we've got my new organization has got people doing amazing work in very, very dangerous circumstances as a result of the Syria um, crisis. But if you think about the geopolitics, they, to any American planner who's thinking about risks to their own country, never mind risks to their allies, the geopolitics of a crumbling state structure in the Middle East, which is not a fanciful notion now. I mean, the Syrian state may not exist as a nation state in any kind of meaningful form at the end of this crisis. Uh, the Jordanian, the Lebanese state has had, I think, 15% of its population has now entered as refugees. I mean, there are refugees are equal in number to 15% of the population. Jordan, 20% of the population. I mean, just so we understand, that's like 15 million people arriving in Britain. That's a big convulsion for the, the geopolitical structure in the Middle East. So the hard question is um, whether or not it's possible to maintain a distance uh, from the conflicts in the Middle East when uh, the geopolitics are so significant. I think there'll obviously be extreme resistance to get, there is extreme resistance to getting involved because of the lessons of the last few years, last decade, um, and never mind the uh, economic crunch that America faces. But I think that's, the, that's really the hard thing. It, it's obvious, really, that this is a, this is, this is a period much more akin to, a, uh, to the kind of um, mandate that Bill Clinton left to George Bush in 2000 and that George Bush said that he wanted. Bill Clinton, his last State of the Union, said, now we focus at home. And George Bush said before the election, we're not the world's policemen. 9-11 changed that, but we're clearly reverting in, the, in a post-9-11 post period, we're reverting back to that kind of sentiment. The question is whether or not it's possible, given what's going on in the Middle East as a result of the rise of the open society, challenges to autocratic regimes, etc., etc. Mm. Never mind the yeah. intra-regional power plays that are massive. No, I, mean, I think it seems to me that Obama actually came in with quite a coherent response, uh, intellectual response, to the post-Iraq, post-financial crisis world, and that he had three basic propositions. The first is, we're going to do nation building at home. I'm going to be a domestic president. We've got to rebuild the American economy because that's the source of American strength. It's also what matters most to American citizens. The second is, no more wars in the Middle East. I'm going to get out of Iraq and Afghanistan. I'm not going to get into another war. 
And the third is uh, the pivot to Asia, uh, which is a counterpart of, you know, this is where the, f the future is going to be made, not the Middle East. So insofar as we have a foreign policy strategy, it's about Asia, it's not about the Middle East. And those are the three points. The question is whether they can survive events. As David, David said, it's like Harold Macmillan's old thing about events, dear boy, events. Well, there's, the, the Middle East happens to have blown up. So can he, can he, does he say, OK, I'm going to stick with the strategy that I came in with. It's still the right idea. Or does he say, actually, you know, there's, we're in a new world in the way that George W. Bush had to do after 9-11, rip up the old plan. And, and I, I think at the moment he's trying to stick with plan A. That's, uh, the question is, can he? And... Um, you know, just a final point. I mean, I think that there may be an analogy not just with Clinton and so on, but with the 1930s, where Roosevelt was, you know, had a huge domestic economic rebuilding effort to, to make. And even when he was intellectually convinced of the need to get involved in Europe, he faced uh, public opinion, which absolutely didn't want to. And if you look at the opinion polls on Syria, I think that's like 12% support for intervention. So even if Obama was more interventionist, I don't think he could do it. He does have a, a foreign policy group that's different, of course, this time around. Now, they are the B team compared to the first time around. They're not as impressive. Uh, but, I mean, Geithner was very much a China guy. Lou, Secretary of Treasury, now is not much more domestic. Uh, Clinton was very much an architect of economic statecraft and the pivot to Asia. Uh, Kerry just pushed back earlier today what was going to be his eighth trip to the Middle East, I believe, since he's been nominated secretary, so that he could do more meetings on the Middle East um, in Washington. That's a different pivot. Um, you know, uh, you've got Tom Donilon, who is very much China-oriented, gone. Susan Rice, who's much more Middle East than Africa. I mean, the, the, the people in place are, are less oriented towards that pivot but still, overwhelmingly, the political people advising Obama are going to be telling him, don't, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And if you do do it, do it differently. You know, um, you know in, 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 engage multilaterally, lead from behind. Don't, don't, don't put your name on this stuff. Um, you know, even if you're, again, if you're going to provide military support, don't do it yourself, but facilitate. I, I guess I go back to the question on to David, and, and w which is, you know, you say, you know, this is going to be hard because it's going to affect the United States. I don't see many people, even in Washington, thinking that into the third year of civil war now in Syria, with the government collapsing and metastasizing into Sunni versus Shia across many countries, some of which you didn't mention yet, right, Iraq and, and, and the rest, I don't see many Americans seriously thinking, wow, this is a huge problem for us. It's an embarrassment, uh, but a problem? I mean, an actual national security problem. I see Kissinger going up uh, on, on Fareed Zakaria this weekend, 90 years old, but still going strongish, and, uh, and basically saying, can you explain to me, you know, what is our, I'm not going to keep doing that, uh, what, 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 is, what is the strategic interest of the United States in doing anything in Syria? And Fareed, who's a pretty balanced guy, kind of looked at him and was like, no, nah, I'm not going to, I'm not even going to go there. So, uh, you know, I kind of wonder, you know. Can I, before we go to the questions, because we've focused a lot, I think, rightly on the power balance and the relationship, because that's the reality. But I think David raised some interesting issues earlier about other groupings uh, that might play a useful role in governance in this world, of which is G0-ish. And I agree, the G20 is more or less moribund. The G8 is, in my view, basically a joke. Uh, and uh, uh, the G7 can occasionally be useful as a finance minister group, but, but only in exceptional circumstances. Now, one of the things I'd like to turn this to you, David, given what you're going to do, what are the role, what is the role in this sort of vacuum of international coordination of um, non-governmental actors? What can you do? Uh, and I'm not just thinking of as groupings like yours, but also, for better and for worse, of course, the role of private business. Yeah, no, I think that the, you've got to recognise that the greatest force of integration is, is, is economic and the private sector is playing an absolutely you know, vital, central role uh, to that. So I, I, I wouldn't want to sort of neglect that side of it. I think that you have to believe... You, you, the truth is that NGOs, above all are picking up the pieces at the bottom of the cliff. I mean, we are uh, having to uh, deal with, more, in the case of an uh, organisation dealing with displaced people and refugees, humanitarian catastrophes, more, more humanitarian catastrophes, even though there are fewer wars. It's a very odd... So it's more fe people fleeing conflict, even though there are fewer wars, certainly fewer interstate wars. And 
So you've got an NGO community which is, um, uh, in a, it's a growth business in that sense. Now, there's also a very big change because you've got new players on the scene. I mean, the biggest provider of humanitarian aid in Syria is Jabhat al-Nusra, who are the jihadist group. They're running a social welfare function of a very um, widespread kind in the rebel areas, obviously. And so you've got new uh, non-state players. You've also got Islamic states playing a bigger role. The Chinese are not in the humanitarian space particularly. They do their work through the uh, UN. They're, quite, uh, they're still contributors to Western peacekeeping. And I think it is interesting that if you're interested at all in conflict prevention, it's still the UN system that does that. And there are famous examples of failure but if you look at East Timor, if you look at Sierra Leone, there are actually examples of relative success. And in the Balkans, you know, it's worth a mention, the, what the EU is doing in the Balkans is, is done well. What the African Union has done on land in Somalia and what the EU has done on the sea in the uh, Gulf of Aden uh, in terms of piracy is, is real. So the I would say the humanitarian world, the humanitarian agencies are, we're at the bottom of the cliff trying to deal with the victims. The people putting up fences at the top of the cliff are still NGO, uh, are still um, UN-sponsored uh, peace and other organisations. Can we talk also a bit about this? Back down, there's this sort of idea of regional multilateral endeavours, um, and since the theme of this cultural, uh, this um, these um, uh, seminars is very much. Africa focused. I think the, 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 the question of how that will evolve is very interesting. And I've been quite impressed. I mean, the, uh, you mentioned Somalia, the OAU. Um, Latin America is another very interesting case. Uh, right at the moment, well, at least thank God it's not actually collapsed. Europe is sort of not too impressive. But uh, I mean, if you can't sort things out globally, in many regions, there are ways that you can think about doing some things locally with the countries there, governments, NGOs, and some support from outside powers. Um, I mean, is, that a fruit, is that a more fruitful way of thinking I mean, about handling a lot of the governance? The logic is absolutely impeccable, but the reality is not inspiring. I think it uh, would be a diplomatic way of putting it. I mean, the AU's just celebrated its 50th birthday, and the commentary all over Africa was not 50 years of uh, great achievement. achievement yeah. I mean, so, but the logic is very strong. I think one, one interesting question is why, um, we can come to Europe separately, but I think one, is, one in Africa, if you think in, in Southern Africa, South Africa, it focused internally. Kenya, East Africa focused internally. Nigeria, West Africa focused internally. The sort of the locomotives of stronger regional organization or sub-regional organization are internally focused on at the moment. If that changes, then I think you could, then the logic I think could assert itself. I, I think the logic is overwhelming and that's one reason I have the views I do about Europe, but I wouldn't want to say that current practice is the best advertisement for them. Well, but at least one thing, I was thinking about your proposition they haven't achieved, and this is perhaps very negative, and I can see the huge problems with it, um, but they have avoided a huge sort of questioning of the whole legacy of colonial borders, which was one of the principles they, they, they adopted. And in, in the Middle East, that seems to me now really open to question whether that is going to survive. And if we start reshaping all the country, national borders of the world, we can end up with almost, seems to me, almost limitless uh, um, chaos. Africa economically is doing better, though, with huge problems. So that might improve the capacity of governments to provide order. The other area th that I wanted to go to, um, perhaps Ian would consider about, you mentioned functional institutional arrangements, which I think have probably been the most successful thing we've done. Um, uh, you know, the, the um, for better or worse, the trade uh, arrangements um, and so forth, uh, the, um, the specialised age, some of the specialised agencies have been reasonably effective, even though the high level geopolitics un behind them is really hasn't worked very well. Is that a, not a possible way to deliver some of these, the, the public goods, global public goods we can, we want? Um, creating institutions which have, serve a very specific purpose. There are many, many of them, and which are really the pretty important plumbing of the economic and political structure, and we tend to ignore them. What do you think, Ian? Well, um, 
I mean, I, I guess when I think about why, so the answer is I think no globally, but yes, in terms of provision of public goods, and many of those public goods will be very important indeed, and trade is absolutely one of them. The fact that it isn't global doesn't mean that it's bad. It's, it's, it's better, it's more integrated, it works. For me, the question when I talk about functionality is what's driving integration? What are the things driving integration? I am all to, I believe that, that David, your point on, um, on getting the logic right in Africa will happen. And I think the reason it will happen is because the building blocks are being put into place. It's not just about commodities. It's also about consumption. You're creating governance that domestically that is clearly picking up. You're educating women. You're urbanizing. But you're also, you know, what you really need to bring these places to market is you need infrastructure that goes beyond the individual countries. And absent really strong integrating logic that will tear these countries apart or that will force them into blocks, there's lots of economic reasons why these countries should actually start hanging more together as the, uh, as the development continues. I, I believe in that story. If you look at the Middle East, there is an institution that is probably going to do, get stronger and become and, 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 and integrate more closely, and that's the GCC, yeah. which is an organization of Sunni Arab monarchies. And the Jordanians are, have signed up, and wouldn't surprise me if over time the Egyptians think, well, that's where our money's going to come from, so maybe we should do that. You, you'd love, and, and it wouldn't surprise me if, as a consequence, you do bigger international or multinational infrastructure stuff in those countries. The problem is that's a fundamentally divisive reason to integrate. And it goes to the initial question you asked that I thought was really interesting, which is, in a world that's economically interdependent, how do you do governance? And the answer is, you can, that, that can work if the things that are functionally integrating you aren't extraordinarily divisive. And, but sometimes they are extraordinarily divisive. And you know, I look at the NSA issue, the Snowden issue, and I look at cyber in China, and I see the internet should be a place where I can, right, could be incredibly integrative globally. And you could have public goods if everyone just focused on the internet. The only problem is the internet is becoming massively politicized. It needs to be for economic purposes, for political purposes, and as a consequence, what should be a functional uh, a piece of global governance is going to be completely split up. And I, I, I think it's, I mean, completely split up. Uh, I think you'll have functionally different internets in different parts of the world. I think that's very bad for global economic growth. But I think it's very good. It serves efficient political purposes. Sometimes efficient economic purposes and efficient political purposes are at cross purposes. And, and this is one of those places. And that's, that's where I think you do or don't have interdependence problems. Do you have a last word on this before we go just to just the floor? Just a brief thing. It's just quite interesting. Uh, on China's attitude to, to regional organizations. Because um, uh, although the Americans have typically tried to sponsor European integration and been quite, you know, they've sponsored Southeast ASEAN and so on, actually the Chinese seem to hate uh, the, uh, facing a coherent block and their instinctive reaction is to try to split it up. So the, the ASEAN summit, when the uh, Southeast Asian nations tried to form a coherent position on the South China Sea, China picked them off by having a special relationship with Cambodia and others. And now they seem to be trying to do the same in trade disputes with the European Union, so that uh, the Chinese not only gave the Europeans a lecture about remembering that you were on the slide, but also clearly tried to strike a special deal with Germany. And uh, I was talking to a, a, a German diplomat uh, who said that uh, you know, every time he goes to Beijing, he says he gets what he calls sweet poison poured into his ear, but by which he means the Chinese say, look, you're the only guys that matter in Europe. You're the only serious players. Just forget about those other Europeans. They're a shower. Just do a deal with us. And he said he has to remind himself to say, no, no, you mustn't, mustn't listen to that. We're, we're, we're the European <laughs> Union. You know, we stick together. But... Uh, so that, that's, that's the game, and it's very, very different from the way the Americans have tended to play the European Union, which is to say, come on, guys, get your act together. We want a single phone number. It's a bit of a bore having to deal with 27 countries. Well, I suppose one conclusion of our discussion, if I understood it, is that China is rationally realist, mm. and one thing a rational realist would like to do is to divide. Yeah. Um, I've always felt that if the Europeans had ever got together and were sufficiently effective to be a challenger to the US, they would swiftly have shifted their policy to exactly the same one that the Chinese well, have adopted. Well, war, in fact, old in New York. It, exactly. That was, in fact, they did it beautifully when they had to. They just haven't felt it was necessary so far. I think we've had a 
pretty good discussion of why global governance is next to impossible um, and, uh, and discuss some of the ways in which one might be able to get round it, um, these problems, at least to some degree. Uh, I would only say that despite these views, um, nevertheless it moves in the sense that an enormous amount of global governance has happened in quite a large number of areas, particularly economic ones, which we haven't focused on, but I could discuss even global financial regulation, uh, imperfect though it is. But anyway, with this introduction, I'd be very happy to take questions. Now, the only rule is you're going to have to wait until you get a microphone, say who you are, and please, if possible, ask a question, or at least a very brief comment. I'll take about three at a time and then sort of spread them out. That way I can be reasonably confident that we're sort of managing our time effectively. So who would like to ask the first question? This gentleman here, please. If you stood up when you... Yes, if you stand up, then it will be easier for them to see you. Please, and just wait till the microphone. Um, uh, Andrew Ward, Youth Business International. If we all wo woke up and it was a dream that actually we never had a G8, G7, G20, what would we be missing um, if we could have one answer from each of you? That's a very nice question. Uh, okay, another... Uh, 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 this gentleman here. Uh, good evening. My name is. This is working. Um, my name is William Wong. My question is on digital governance. Traditionally, we've analysed international relations and geopolitics usually through actors, states, and NGOs and the like. And now, of course, in the last ten years or so, we've got an added dimension of complexity, which is really people like us. Uh, if you look at Prism, and I say and so on. So. My real, my real question is, in this really messy world, um, everyone is an actor now, everyone has a voice. Who is to govern whom? But also in, 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 in the cyber world, um, the United States will constantly allege that they're also state-sponsored terrorism. Right? So uh, states like China and North Korea and the like, sponsoring cyber attacks on financial in systems, in infrastructure, and so on. So it's very complex. It's no longer just nation states. And nuclear deterrents are no use in any of these. So the, the bottom line is, who is going to govern whom and how? Thank you. Um, a third question somewhere in the back. Yes, the gentleman at the back there. Could you stand up? Yes, you. Yes. Yes. Uh, <coughs> Um, my name is Joe Cooper. Um, I was thinking about the, the G0 and what, the, what that actually means in practice. And I was wondering what you could talk a, a little bit about the role of the UN, which should seemingly fill the void. And we haven't heard much, much talk about the role of the UN. OK, very uh, good questions. Um, I'm going to start with you, Gideon, actually. Um, let's suppose we'd never heard of any of the... Nobody had ever bothered to create the G5, the G7, the G8, uh, the G20. We haven't actually discussed the G77 or any of those. We'll leave that aside for the moment. Um, would we be missing anything? Not in the normal run of things, but I think every now and then they've been important. I mean, clearly the G20 had its hour in 2009 and uh, post the financial crisis. And then it really did, did matter that, uh, if nothing else, they sent a signal that there was going to be global economic cooperation at a time when everyone thought we might retreat into protectionism and so on. Uh, I mean, David, I think, can probably talk much more eloquently than me about the Millennium Development Goals and what, what the Blair government and others did around that. So the, that, that was important. Um, and I think even when they appear to be nothing, be doing nothing particularly, I would prefer it to be in a world where there's a sort of date in the diary where all the most important leaders actually do get together and, and sit around and talk. Better that than they never meet. And the UN is certainly, to, to address the question about the UN briefly, uh, it, obviously it has an international legal standing that none of these other organisations have, so it's incredibly important that way. But, you know, it's a very uh, stiff, difficult uh, environment. People stand at the podium and make speeches, at least at the G20. There are only 20 of them, actually. I think they've 
somehow managed to make it 33. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a slightly less formal situation and there's more opportunity for discussion. And even those discussions lead nowhere. Better that, they're, that we get into the habit that these people from very different systems, different economies, have meet and, and talk. I think that is important, just, just almost as a symbol. Um, Ian, um, to focus on the last question, because... Uh, um, particularly the uh, um, so is actually linked the, the implications of a G zero world. What does it really mean, and where does the UN fit? Well, I mean, if we had had <coughs> no G twenty, the world, in my view, would look a little less G zero ish right now. So I'd have one less book. Um, you know, I, I, I do think that the actual creation of the G20 and the recognition and codification and institutionalization of this regular organization that brings together these 20 largest economies, a whole bunch of emerging markets, and, and not persisting with the G7 plus one, where the Russians were never really relevant, it was really a G7, they didn't even show up a couple times, um, would, would have the emerging, on, on, the, on the downside, it would have the emerging markets take longer to get to a point that they feel like they need to start saying things that are internationally substantive and statesmanlike. Um, but on the other hand, um, it allowed for much quicker abdication on the part of the developed states and more inward focus more quickly. Now, you could argue it's a good thing you put the G20 in place because you, were, you had this shifting in the pow underlying power balance that was going to break the old US-led global order at some point. So if you have to do that, might as well do it soon so that you can at least start the process of getting through your G0 and then creating whatever it is that's going to come afterwards, then wait until things get really bad. Um, and, and certainly the G20 uh, had a function right after the financial crisis because you needed at least the Chinese and probably a couple other players outside the G7 as well to help coordinate. I think that was useful. Did you need to create a regular G20 to do that? Absolutely not. And, um, you know, uh, did, uh, does the UN play a particular role in this world? It plays a, a function, it plays an Antarctic role, which is great. The World Health Organization, look at that. I mean, you've actually, the Chinese have become much more transparent and proactive in their scientists and laboratories working with international standards and trying to understand the latest variant of avian flu in a way that is much, much more resilient than what we saw with SARS. And that is a United Nations sponsored organization that made that happen. Thank God they existed. I am not John Bolton saying, let's lop seven floors off that building, we wouldn't miss it. But the Security Council and the incredible ineffectualness of the Security Council should have told us that the G20 was a bad idea at the head of state level and didn't. We didn't learn that lesson. David, on the two questions, the first and third, on um, what would we miss without them and uh, I think that the, um, the shaming of the Western world in respect of the development agenda through the G8 meetings over the last 10 years has been a positive uh, factor um, and has been uh, has made a difference to a lot of people's lives. So I think that if you ask me to give one example, I would pick the the pursuit of the Millennium Development Goals, um, the fact that uh, we're on track to meet the anti-poverty target early, etc. So I think that's been helped by that. But I, I mean, there's a wider question. It's that all these institutions, you want to ask two, two points. One, are they powerful? Two, are they legitimate? The trouble with the G8 is that it's neither powerful nor legitimate. And that uh, explains the, the, the relative uh, weakness of it. Um, on the uh, UN, I think that uh, in some ways the UN is its own worst enemy, and that's obviously the traditional thing, is to bash the bureaucracy. But uh, actually, the UN is a symptom of what nation states are willing to cede to the international level and do at the international level. And so if you just think about peacekeeping, uh, there are all sorts of weaknesses in uh, UN peacekeeping, but some of them arise from the fact that no Western countries now put their troops into UN peacekeeping. I'm not just talking about the US and the UK, um, post uh, Somalia, post in, in the US case, post Afghanistan in the UK case, Germany is the 50th uh, highest contributor to um, UN peacekeeping. And so there's a disengagement. That's not the UN's fault, it's the nation state's fault. And I think one's got to look, um, look at where the power does lie, because the power and legitimacy still does reside at the 
um, national level. I think it's also worth saying, I don't have to develop it, the UN does a lot more than any of us know. Uh, Pascal Lamy's got this lovely phrase about the house of humanity. And the house of humanity is protected in all sorts of ways uh, from storms and uh, disease and God knows what else. And it's kept going by, uh, its foundations are tended to by UN organizations <coughs> that uh, we don't need to know about, but are actually, we'd be sorry if they weren't there. I think they, I actually, we've gone away from this, but I do very strongly support the view that uh, um, these specialised organisations, a whole raft of them, have an enormous impact on our lives. We don't realise how large it is. Um, and here's the IMF trying to save Europe from itself, which we perhaps should mention. Um, and this is because uh, the ECB and the German government trust the IMF and not the European Commission. That is quite an interesting fact. Uh, there aren't many people in the world who would say they trust the IMF like that, but there we are. Uh, I just wanted to add one other thing because my focus on economics. Uh, the, uh, during the worst of the financial crisis, uh, October, September, October 2008, for about a year, the G7 first and later the G20 really did play a huge role. And, uh, uh, and the most important moment was a G7 meeting in, in, uh, at the Minister of Finance level in, in, uh, in Washington before the G20 meeting, this was in October, which, in which they all agreed under in, in extraordinary crisis that they were going to save every financial institution in the world. That was a rather extraordinary decision. Now, it's an interesting question whether it was a right decision, but it certainly changed the world because it established too big to fail as a fundamental principle. Um, <laughs> that's governing. Uh, uh, one other point I would make, which is important, I think one of the things that these sort of institutions do, and I think it builds on a comment maybe Gideon made, um, it forces government bureaucracies to talk to one another, and it talks, forces politicians to talk to one another. And over time, at least it means that they know what they're disagreeing about. And that's often very important to know what you're disagreeing about. Now, we will now go on to the fascinating question of how do you govern cyberspace? Um, Ian started on this by saying, well, we're going to solve that problem by disintegrating cyberspace. I think that's what you suggested. Um, I discovered uh, recently that, that the U.S. actually has a cyber command now as a branch of its armed forces. So the U.S. considers it a region of the world in some, uh, in, in some, in some sense, which presumably the U.S. intends to govern or defend or I don't know what it's going to do. So how do we do govern uh, the digital whatever, we, we, uh, metasphere? We intend to attack it uh, <laughs> bef uh, before we intend to defend it, let's be clear. Um, I mean, there, there is, I mean, in Washington, you talk to folks on cyber, they'll tell you it's like a football match and you're in the first period and it's 86 to 43, right? And, you know, fortunately, the U.S. is on the 86 side. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of scoring going on in cyber right now. There's not a lot of defending. And these are people that are spending an enormous amount of effort and cash to try to figure the stuff out from scratch. Um, and and they're, they're having a hard time um, with it. But, you know, what... I do, I do think it gets disintermediated. I mean, you know, there are a lot of American corporations that are doing a lot of investing in China. Facebook, Twitter, and Google are not three of them. Um, and, you know, when the Chinese, then when the Iranians go to Huawei and say, hey, can you develop our internet for us? Think about what that's going to do with the China-Iran relationship over time. How much information they're going to have, how much integration they're going to have, how much less the U.S. will have, and what that'll mean for Chinese politics in Iran and they'll need the energy a lot more, and their support for the sanctions regime, and everything else, and proliferation, than it would with the United States. These things are going to matter. Um, I, I think that there is a, a very big difference between the information revolution, which empowers people, your question, and the data revolution, which does not. It empowers organizations. Uh, in the U.S., historically, that has been corporations, but as we found out over the last weekend, increasingly it's also the state, and certainly in other governments in China, it's the state. Now, when we look at Arab Spring, there's this sense that, oh, my God, the information revolution, everyone's got cell phones, they're going to bring down governments, and that's because those are very weak governments, right? I mean, the Egyptian government, you remember Davos. We were having this discussion a couple of years ago, and suddenly in the middle of Davos, there's the, the, there are demonstrations, and the Egyptian government shuts off their internet. 
Why? Because they don't have the ability, the strength, the money, the background to track dissidents, find out what they're saying, and arrest them. And the people, they're just not that good at it. The Chinese, the Americans, we're really good at it, <laughs> right? So if, I would not make the presumption that the state loses the battle versus the inmates, right, um, in determining where the power is going to lie as the information versus data revolution fight continues. I have a slightly different um, uh, view of a couple of aspects of that. One is that I think every government, strong or weak, lives in coalition with its own people. Every government, autocratic or democratic, lives in coalition with its own people. The Chinese government spent a lot of time thinking and finding out what their own people care about. The discipline of popular consent is a strong discipline, a stronger discipline than it was 10 years ago. And it's a discipline in part empowered by the ability of people to communicate with each other, sometimes under the view of the state, but nonetheless in ways that they could never have communicated uh, before. So I think that is important. It's not about technological revolutions or, you know, it's not about saying that Mubarak was brought down by Twitter, um, but, but recognizing that Technology is facilitating contact between people, and that is helping provide a discipline on governments. Um, the second thing is uh, I know very, very much less about. And my instinct is the world um, is, going to, is, is never going to be less open than it is today. That the drive towards a more open society globally is irreversible. And you've obviously studied this and you think there is the power to disintegrate what is currently integrated. I, I, I'm skeptical about that. I think we'll never be less open. I think it'll never be harder for the vast bulk of people to find out more than they do now. I think the gap between what is known privately by states and companies and what is known publicly by people, that gap is going to narrow not expand. Let me throw something out at you, see how you respond to it. Yeah. So I think about Chinese internet, and Chinese internet 1.0 was all about the Great Firewall of China. And it's, you know, we're going to stop people from having access to stuff, and so we're going to make sure that all of these things that they're looking for, they're not going to be able to look for it, we're going to blacklist and all the rest. They quickly realized that wasn't going to work. Chinese internet response 2.0 is, let's have extraordinary surveillance, and let's also populate all these microblogs and chat rooms. We, the, the water's already past the dam. We can't do anything about that. But while the water's rushing over the dam, let us fig, let, let's dig and figure out where the river's going to go. And let's have a whole bunch of filters or nets that are watching and catching these big fish that are in this water. And, you know, you've got hundreds of thousands of folks being paid by the Chinese government on microblogs that are, you know, actually moving and steering these conversations in ways that are useful for the Chinese government. Bo Shalai, much more vulnerable in that environment, um, you know, uh, fo th th talking about, uh, you know, sort of the billions of dollars that Xi Jinping may be worth from Bloomberg. Actually, let's go on a, a patriotic anti-Bloomberg rant that's much more useful from our perspective. The question is, I mean, I, I agree with you. This is an, we don't know where this is going to play, but how, why are you so convinced that we're never going to be more open. I mean, I thought it was interesting that 1984. Never going to be less, less open. That 1984 is selling what you know, sort of uh, record levels of copies in the United States right now. People are really concerned uh, that the state is uh, is not going to be uh, is, is not is not purely on the defensive here. But surely the point is both could be true. In the uh, and it seems to me that is the case in the sense that the public at large, if in a whole host of ways. Uh, and as the spread of the underlying technologies um, continues, all over the world knows more than ever before. I think that is correct. The access to knowledge uh, generate. I'm not saying this. I don't believe in linear things. I would never use the word never. Never is a really long time. But, but uh, so uh, we're presumably not talking billions of years. So uh, the uh, but. Uh, never for, for us means the next 50 years or 100 years. Actually, for me, it actually means even less than that. So the, <laughs> the uh, never applies to anything that happens after my death. Uh, the, the, um, but it seems to me that people have the capacity to know more than ever before. 
um, as a result of the development of these technologies, and it does seem to me very difficult to imagine that will stop. In principle, you could imagine pretty well everything that's ever been published being available on the internet, uh, and the communication amongst our people is, is extraordinary. But for the very same reason, governments can and do know more about us by many, many orders of magnitude than ever before. And, and I haven't even mentioned corporations. I mean, basically, it seems to me pretty obvious that anybody who uses Google must realize that Google knows everything about you, just everything. Uh, and that's just a reality. So it seems to me both are true, and that means that like nearly all great technological innovations, um, it's a double-edged sword. It's definitely a double-edged sword, but just be absolutely clear, government knows a millionth about your likes, dislikes, preferences, as, interests. As Google. As, you know, Tesco's know about what you want to buy, as Google knows about what you're interested in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Government might decide in very restricted circumstances to find out an awful lot about Martin Wolf, other than by reading him in the Financial Times and his brilliant columns, but they might decide they need to find out an awful lot about you. But as a generality, Government knows an absolute piddling fraction of what we think and like and dislike compared to so some of the corporations. They, that's that because they've not really started working at this. Isn't that the point, Ian? No, that's because the 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 the, the they the, can in the principle obtain dot, everything. The, the governmentdirect.org website is not the uh, <laughs> router for that, everything. Isn't, you know. isn't what we've just discovered over, over the last uh, weekend that? I mean, at least in the U.S., should they decide? Well, actually, Martin Wolf is. Uh, interesting it, in all sorts terrorists. of ways we'd never realise. They can find out about you. But all that <laughs> info is there sitting because Google, they have access to Google. Right. Well, yeah, they, should they decide? But yeah. they, but, but, uh, That's the point. They have access to all this corporate stuff. I mean, and I, and, that in, and so they're not, they're not separate. I accept the point that... I should go on to let somebody it. else ask a question, I think. Yeah. Well, okay. Fair By enough. the way, the one question we didn't answer, which is the core question you asked, but by implication it was answered, is who will govern, who will provide digital governance? I think the implication of our discussion is well, there will, won't be one entity that provides I've that. I've got a brief sentence on that. Oh, I, mean, okay. I, think, I think the Americans are very ambivalent about, at least in the security sphere, whether they want that because they think they're ahead. So that what was the greatest single act of uh, brilliant cyber sort of sabotage, it was Stuxnet, which was probably done by the Americans and the Israelis and disabled briefly the Iranian nuclear program. So as long as the Americans think they have an edge, they don't really have an interest in a, in a big international agreement. But I think they're beginning to realize that their technological sophistication that gives them an edge is also makes them incredibly vulnerable because their society is that much more. OK, I'm going to move on to three more questions. Uh, the gentleman here. Ah, there is one. <laughs> Okay, you next, please. Uh, so my name is Thomas Patterson. Um, I guess I'm an international citizen, uh, being Australian, British, and long, long-term resident of Mexico. Um, one of the things which I saw living in England was that uh, one of the really powerful moves in the European Union and, and Great Britain was the, and the United Kingdom rather, was both the devolution and raising up of powers and one of the really clever things which has happened over the last 20 years has been some powers moving down to very local bases and others moving up and I think that becomes one of the interesting questions in what is the function of a G20 or a G8 or a, or a G0 is which powers do we want to get up to that level I mean obviously global epidemiology is a pretty good thing to have at the World Health Organization level and few would argue with that um, and one of the big issues in taxation at the moment is arbitrage and using the global organizations to eliminate arbitrage for tax purposes so that supranational companies in one way or another, call them transnational, call them multinational, can't take advantage of that. I'd be interested in the views of, uh, of the panelists on what, um, what other powers you want to see at a global governance level, because if we can't answer that question, it's really hard to design organizations for implementing those powers. Yes, this was actually the first question I asked, but they sort of ducked, away, ducked from it, so we'll go back to it. Uh, lady there, please. Christina Scaglione, and my question is, 
the country we've probably least talked about is the one we're actually sitting in, the UK. And I wonder if that's just a reflection of British modesty or in some way it signals the current and the future role it will play in global politics. And then if I can cheat and add a quick question in for Ian, if you were advising Obama on foreign policy, what would you advise him? On anything? Generally, yes. Okay, well, what would be the position? Okay, and gentleman behind you, yes, please. Uh, my name is Srinigali. Taking uh, David's point as a, uh, economic reasons are trade as a f greatest force of integration. If you are talking the uh, same topic about 15 years back, probably you wouldn't have mentioned some of the countries that you have mentioned today, be it uh, you know India, Latin markets, Africa, or, you know probably China also. And today, you know, yes, China is a very important player. But what that means, you know, probably have you assumed that these countries, particularly China or any of these important countries today, that they are on irreversible growth path. That is, next 15 years, what could actually change this discussion? Okay, and second uh, point is actually in terms of some of the companies today, be it Shell or, be it, or Exxon Mobil, they are almost larger than some of the countries in terms of the size. What role so, you know, uh, these large organizations could play in this global governance? Okay, okay I'm, I'm going to start uh, with asking David about uh, British modesty. <laughs> <laughs> You were a famously modest uh, foreign secretary. Um, exactly said. Um, uh, a modest man with a lot to be modest about. The, uh, um, the, uh, Churchill, I, I can't think. remember who he it said it. No, I thought it was Churchill. Churchill said it of Atlee. Churchill said it of Atlee, that's yes. right. Yeah. Um, uh, someone told me the other day that um, it wasn't me, but uh, someone, else, someone I was with said, oh, uh, you know, we've got to be humble about this. And uh, someone we were with said... Uh, just remember what uh, Golda Meir said to Moshe Dayan, uh, you've got to gr be great before you can be humble. <laughs> quite a touche point. Um, British modesty. Look, I think that um, actually it relates to the first question. Um, your question relates to the first question. The future is about dynamic economic entities and those more often than not are metropolitan areas, not countries. Uh, the fav my favourite statistic is the 40 largest metropolitan areas in the world, um, 8 to 10 million people, 18% of housing, 65% of global GDP, 85% of global technological innovation. Uh, this is not just an urbanising century, it's a century in which urban areas are going to become big economic players, I think they're going to become big political players um, as well. Um, but I don't buy the death of the nation state argument, the sort of nation state is too big for the small problems, too small for the big problems, because the nation state is where political legitimacy resides more than anywhere else, and political legitimacy remains absolutely key to getting anything um, done. The, the issue for the UK, I think, is, is twofold. Will it devolve in England in the way that it has in Scot to Scotland and to Northern Ireland, actually, and to Wales? Um, because the English question is actually a devolution question. How does Manchester become the Boston of Britain? How does you know, Newcastle become... I don't know, you can choose your, choose the, choose your point... Um, but I think there's also the question of whether or not the, D the UK disconnects itself from its neighbourhood because, uh, and, and therefore the European question. I think if we opt out of Europe, uh, uh, it's a very bleak prospect because this is a world that's connecting, not disconnecting. And the idea that we can connect the world by disconnecting from the rest of Europe, I think, is foolish, really. And when I... Um, uh, and the connection is political through the European Union, um, but it's also, this, um, it's also about immigration. Uh, the idea that you can prosper as a country by reducing the number of foreign students who come and study here is completely perverse and ridiculous and uh, defeating, self-defeating. Um, so I worry about uh, a Britain that starts disconnecting. You, you, you know, you can't just have this be, be the, the, the venue for a global conversation if you're not willing to be part of the conversation, uh, I would argue. And uh, so it's a pretty fundamental, pretty fundamental point. So you've expressed your admiration for our government. <laughs> In what think he's been aspect? <laughs> None that I could hear. <laughs> Gideon, on British modesty and uh, possibly also this subsidiarity question in global governance. Where, what do we need up there and what 
should we be actually pushing down? Well, on, on the, the modesty question, just briefly, I mean, I think it, it, it relates actually to the sort of subterranean argument we were going to having about declinism and the end being... Because I think the British, because they're very conscious of their own decline, we tend to see it in America. And maybe we overinterpret uh, so that, uh, you know, I was with a senior British civil servant the, the other day who was saying, you know, over the course of his career, he had seen the reach of Britain really shrink. And so we look at America and say, well, guys, this is going to happen to you as well. And maybe we're, we're getting slightly ahead of ourselves. But I think, I think it does account for the fact that there are a lot of British declinists um, when, when they look at the United States. On the question of, you know, what's, what's best done at what level? I mean, I thought you came up with a pretty good list. I mean, something like epidemiology would, would obviously has to be done at a global level. Climate change has to be That's done at a global one. level. But, uh, but we're not terribly That's good at one. it. That's the big one. Um, and that's, you know, where we may pay the biggest price for the G0 world and the inability to get beyond national preoccupations. The, and, it, and as David said, a hell of a lot of it comes down to legitimacy because uh, you've got to somehow be this international politician who can come back and say, I've struck a deal, it's going to cause some short-term pain, but it's fair and, and so on, and nobody's yet been able to, to, to do that. Uh, so although one can intellectually identify the areas that need to be dealt with at, global, at a global level, actually getting uh, national politicians and politicians to derive their power from the nation-state to then... Uh, meet at a global level and come up with a deal and, and then get it to stick is, is the, the dilemma. I'm going to get to you, Ian. Um, you can come back to the others, but and there was a specific question, which I think you're, you're perfectly positioned to give. If you had three minutes with the president, which I'm sure you do regularly, um, <laughs> what do you tell him that he should be doing that he isn't doing? or the other way around? Well, I guess I, I'd say two things. One, one, John Huntsman and I actually just wrote a piece in the New York Times last week um, about uh, what we wanted him to do with the China summit. He did none of it. Um, one of the things I would have liked him to do was make John Huntsman Secretary of State, um, frankly. I mean, this is a guy who uh, is, uh, he actually knows China better than any other foreign policy guy that was relevant. He was bipartisan. He was a Republican who actually served as ambassador to China, did an incredibly coherent job. And he also knows business. And if you want to talk about the pivot to Asia, the relevance of the rise of China, the impact of, state uh, of economic statecraft, state capitalism, why wouldn't you want that person in that position? No, let's get someone who does the Middle East and Europe. Um, it doesn't make sense. Uh, we, we need a, a, a new communique. We, we need to spend time. The, the rise of China and the, and the ability, I think it was Gideon that you raised the point before, you know, how do we deal with China? Uh, can't, is it possible that Obama and Xi Jinping will be able to mitigate the structural challenges? The, I, I think the answer is maybe, but they only can do it if they care, and they don't. They care. They, I mean, they're willing to put enough effort in to show that, oh, we want to manage it. But this is absolutely not a priority for these two leaders. And in four years' time, it's going to get so much worse. It's going to be so, I, I think we just had the last election that you're going to see in the U.S. for decades where China is not a fundamental politicized issue for one or both of the candidates running for the presidency. The impact that's going to have on the relationship is very negative. So I, I'd try to fix it now when it's not urgent. But of course, like climate, you, don't, you won't do it until it becomes urgent. And that is exactly where we are right now. The big structural thing I would argue for, which is related, is that the United States does not have institutions to deal with the China challenge effectively. We've got, I think, the best State Department today in the world in terms of international diplomacy and capabilities used to be Britain. Um, it's, uh, you know, we've put a lot more money into it now. Um, certainly the most effective CIA, NSA, uh, Defense Department. The U.S. does not have an organization that does economic statecraft. We've got the Commerce Department. It's a place you don't want your kids to work, right? The U.S. needs to have something like Medi in Japan. They need to be able to have something that's structured by sector that works with the private sector that can do this. They need commerce and USTR and energy. They should not be separate. They should be together, and they need to work with the private sector in sectors, and they need to coordinate internationally with like-minded countries. The U.S. is very far from even considering this as an option. Um, and, and I think that's the most meaningful thing the U.S. could do structurally. That's, that's pretty well socialism, isn't it? Um, <laughs> like Japan? 
Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, um, if I may, t t going to take the chair chair's prerogative of answering the last question because I think I'm more qualified. Uh, <laughs> uh, British modesty knows no <laughs> bounds. <laughs> We didn't say anything about the, mo the modesty of Britons. Uh, I think the question of whether countries on their irreversible growth paths is a really interesting and deep one. The, um, and and uh, there are two points I'd make on it, because we could go for, for a long time. Um, we, d development economists talk about something called the middle income trap. And what by that they mean, that there are many countries that have moved from being low income to middle income, which then stop, effectively stop growing. And it's a complicated question. There are remarkably few countries that have grown rapidly. Um, by rapidly, we mean 6 7% or more for more than 25 years or so. Really remarkably few. Um, so we have to be aware that sustaining growth all the way from being really poor to being a developed country is a rare and remarkable achievement. And in the post-war period, you can, can't think of many, and probably the most over that whole period, starting really poor, I mean, you've got the Republic of Korea. I mean, that's yeah. of the large, sing, very small countries like Singapore, Hong Kong, um, Taiwan, also very small. Uh, uh, the... Uh, there are really, it's really a remarkable thing. This said, so that's one, point one. Um, so if I were told that one of the countries that had been growing fast stopped, when I started on development economics in the 60s, the growth miracle country, this may seem the growth miracle country of the 60s and early 70s of the big ones was Brazil. That was just a phenomenal story and it basically stopped. So... I wouldn't be surprised if something stopped. China, and actually, though at a lesser growth rate, India, have managed very fast growth for a generation, and it has changed a lot. And in China's case, there's no story that compares with it. Uh, does this lead you to the conclusion that, that it will continue or that it will not? Um, I think we, we really don't know. Personally, I've been making the argument that it is quite easy to believe, one, on China, that it's going to have quite considerable difficulties in the next 10 years. I don't have time to go through why. One. And two, nonetheless, on balance, I think it's more likely that it will move towards um, lower developed country status over the next generation than not. But it really is incredibly difficult to predict these things. and. Uh, and it wouldn't be terribly surprising if, uh, if uh, quite big difficulties arose. Managing this process from where they are now to where they want to be, as they, they are very well aware, is extremely difficult. So that's all I want to say. I won't go into the companies bigger than countries thing, um, because I think it's a little misleading. Uh, but there, is a, there are a set of huge global governance issues which are affected by the lobbying power of companies. And one of them has already been mentioned, which is the almost complete collapse of the global corporate tax yeah. regime. And that's a pretty big issue, which we don't have time, I think, to go in further. Really, really um, I can take, I think, another round of questions. Really Gentleman right at the back. You, yes, you. You, yes, you. Uh, title for now, then. Ah, yes, I've got to, I will come to that. Uh, thanks. My name's Andy Martin. I just wanted to um, ask if there's a question of um, failure of institutions or leadership. And use the MDGs as a bit of a case study. Because although it's a UN process, it kind of needed the G8 because the locus of the problem was the, jo the donor agenda. And it was about Sorry, folks... what was the... The, the, um, the Development Goals. The, the Millennium Development Goals. Oh, yes. Millennium. And the extent yes, to yes. which the G8 was a good place to do that work, because yes. it was mostly about the donor agenda. And yes. now in the post-2015 world, actually, it's, a, it's just a messier problem. And even if the G8 was effective, it would be the wrong place to do that work. Yes. So maybe the question is, is the skill we need, the effectiveness to sort of build more temporary governance structures that fit the problems that we have, rather than kind of mourn the ones that don't work anymore? That's a very good question. Uh, somebody else? Um, lady there? 
Um, I was just wondering about global governments, governance and the financial sector. Um, let's say like commodity trading, that's really socially irresponsible, that kind of raises food prices too much or um, kind of debt bubbles. Um, I was just wondering, is there a way to deal with that or is that something we just have to uh, live with? Sorry. Uh, and gentleman here. Yeah, Davey, what's the optimal global policy that we need to address climate change? Pache Martin's article recently in the FT, Pache, the Global Oceans Commission, are the biggest pressing global need that's currently not addressed by existing global structures. Let's try and do this quickly so we can perhaps get one or two of what David, uh, the Millennium Goals, um, and, I think, well, I mean, and uh, the geography of how poverty, we go on for this. Yeah, the geography of poverty is changing so far. I think there's one, it's an IMF or a World Bank statistic that a third of the world's poor by 2030 will be in fragile states, i.e. conflict-ridden states. So the whole question of how you get at the most poor, that's under $1.25 um, a day. I think your point that the donors have got to be broader than the G8 is a good one. If the G20 wanted something to do, throwing itself behind the uh, Millennium Development Goals would actually be a, a, a good way of going about it. And um, would be the could be the kind of coalition. I mean, it's over dominated by Europeans, twelve European countries in the G20, but it's still um, it's still important. I just I think your uh, climate uh, you asked about and, uh, it's very very important that people like Martin um, do write about it from the economic side because this is the global catastrophe that's being neglected with the greatest consequence. I think greatest long term consequence. And I've always been a very strong believer in a global deal, but I can't see it happening now. And so I think that that forces you to think about how you take things like this Copenhagen process, the failed summit in Copenhagen in 2009, produced this, uh, quote unquote, accord that I think 70 or 80 countries have now signed up to. And I think it's going to have to be on, on you, you, it's going to have to be pursued in a much more patchwork way rather than just going for the global deal that in the end a handful of countries can end up uh, vetoing. One interesting question, I, don't know if you, I can't remember if you covered this in your column about this, um, Martin, is whether or not there isn't scope for China, which is concerned about um, climate, increasingly concerned about climate, and the EU, which is the world's largest richest single market, where there isn't more scope for a EU-China cooperation on climate, whether there isn't enough of a win-win on economics and environment, that would be a, uh, it wouldn't be the whole, answer the whole problem, but it would set quite an interesting global benchmark. I mean, I think if the EU wants to do anything with China, climate would be high up my list of candidates. Ian, I presume your view from what you said at the beginning and subsequently is that climate, forget it. Well, don't forget it. Just understand who the winners and losers are going to be and, uh, and make bets accordingly because it's clearly continuing to come. But, I mean, I, I want to maybe make something, raise a, a point around this that's maybe a little more provocative, which is I think there's a presumption that, well, at the very least, it's always good to have these meetings. At the very least, it's good that we get the G20 together, we get the Security Council together, they all have the meetings. I could easily make an argument that uh, continuing to try to address climate through global summits is actively pernicious. Because it means that if you got a coalition of the willing together and they were to meet as opposed to the G20, and they were to say, look, we know that we're, we can't get China on board for X, Y, and Z reasons. But this constellation of countries, we've got to, or, or actors, doesn't have to be all countries, feels like we have to do something or else. And we're more responsive. That is one of the best reasons you could argue for why the creation of the G20 to begin with was a bad idea. Right? Is that occasionally it, al it allows too many actors to obviate themselves from responsibility. Just say, you know what? Not it. Can't do it. We did the meeting. We did Rio plus 20. We did Cancun. We did Durban. We did Copenhagen. Let's do it again. And still nothing can't. We, we, sometimes we get to go to, if something's really broken at the global level, let's stop doing global. This doesn't work very well if it's a global problem. <laughs> <laughs> this is the worst case. I mean, actually, I think there are lots of cases where, where uh, I think there are lots of cases where coalitions of the willing, not a phrase I'm very keen on, but given its history, but that is the way to go because certain groups, countries can do it. And it is true in the case of climate change, 20 countries really cover your universe pretty well, but you have to have most of them in. And 
if the US, for example, let's imagine, decides that it won't play ball, it's going to be quite difficult to deal with it. I, wouldn't, I, I would say that given that we, we, I think we all agree that nothing meaningful is going to be done near term with the constellation. I mean, you know, Dave Miliband has done, spoken more eloquently on this for a longer time than many of us, um, certainly than me. Uh, the, um, that, uh, given that, I think about, you know, sort of how badly geoengineering might go if it's handled in an unfettered and unmitigated way. Why would you not want a small, a group, a coalition of the willing that would be able to put some rules of the road together of what, of how you do want to handle that and how you don't as it starts? And, and what kind of consequences will be, will be placed on folks that do it outside of that regime? Uh, why wouldn't you want um, a process, an international process that started investing in some of the technologies that look most promising to handle mitigation or adaptation over the long term? You're right, it's a global problem. But since we're not going to resolve it globally, does that mean that we should just keep doing global meetings that fail? I think the answer is no. I think we should stop that, and it's a mistake. And we've already lost five years um, plus uh, of, doing, of doing global when we knew it wasn't going to work. Gideon. Martin, I think I spotted another question you may be more qualified to answer, certainly than me, which is the one about regulation of global financial institutions. So why don't we invite you? I'm going to, to be very... Uh, <laughs> Your answer to the last one was brilliant, Martin. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. please do... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on. <laughs> no, I'm just going to say something very simple. I have very minimal objectives for global financial regulation, which is that we could create a set of uh, agreements which reduce the chances that the financial sector will blow up the world every 10 years significantly. Uh, I accept the other objectives. They're very important, but this seems to me sort of the minimum objective. And I would say that at the moment I'm not very encouraged for reasons which I think are probably clear from uh, things I and others have written. So... Um, Remind us. Uh, the... The essential reason is that the financial sector um, has constructed a very, very nice um, system which is based on the proposition that there is no equity in it. Because if there is no equity in it, if anything goes badly wrong, the taxpayer is going to pick it up. So they can't understand why they should be expected to have any equity in it. And what has happened as a result of this incredibly long, complicated and tortuous financial regulation discussion uh, is that we've raised the required equity of the financial system, the bank, core banking institutions, from approximately 2 to 3% of the balance sheet to over 3%. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. That's what's happened. So... Uh, I'm afraid even this minimum requirement has not been achieved and I'm not even beginning to talk about the sort of regulation that would uh, really sh shift in any profound way the nature of, uh, of um, finance and I'm not going to go into the specific issues of the role of finance in commodity prices and so forth. So I think it's a very depressing story, alas, um, because of very, very well-organised interests. Um, I think in practice I probably should stop now. Um, I apologise for all those who had, I'm sure, wonderful questions that we didn't get to. Um, I, um, I'm not going to summarise this because I think it's impossible, uh, but I think it's been very fascinating uh, and perhaps for at least some of us a little bit depressing. Uh, the, we don't seem to care really very much what sort of G there is because we seem to agree really do seem to agree that none of them is going to do much good. Now, the exception to that uh, was when things are really bad. And this reminds me, I just had the, I've just done an interview with the outgoing governor of the Bank of England, which will be published in the Financial Times, of course, on Saturday. And, and he used a phrase, so I'm going to attribute it to him, and he may have used it before, uh, of, of the only time when he ever saw the G7 do anything useful, which was October 2008. And he refer, describes this as the audacity of pessimism, uh, which, which I think is brilliant. In other words, if people are frightened enough and the, what they're frightened of is, is imminent enough, they will do something. And the problem, obviously, with the climate thing is that, that it's so remote that nobody is prepared to do something. Um, 
And then, of course, the opposite of audacity of pessimism is the complacency of optimism. And, uh, and the, I, the feeling that, at least for us, for the powerful people, the people who have the weight in the world, things are okay, so why should we do anything very much? And I think that's very much uh, where we are. That's the first big point. So we tend to act when things are very bad. The second point I would make, and I would underline it very strongly because we haven't discussed this very much, that an immense amount of governance goes on out there, which we don't think about in, in areas of economics, intellectual property, health, and so forth. Some good, but some less good. But it, peacekeeping, I think that's very important. And the institutions that provide that can function even if higher level diplomacy is is an extraordinary mess. And the last point I would stress is from this discussion, you will have noticed, I suppose I'm partly responsible, only partly, that the, really there was next to no discussion of any role that Europe plays in all this, and nobody brought it up. It was very much focused on on uh, um, the two greatest powers and their relationship. And clearly, I think what emerged from this is that in many respects, if you're talking about higher level global governance, the relationships between these two powers, the US and China, are going to shape our world. And it's going to be, and it's clearly underlined very much by Ian, and to my mind, completely credibly, an incredibly difficult, um, significant, uh, and significant relationship, and we just have to hope they manage it without blowing everything up, in, in essence. Um, uh, well, the very fact that we hope this is important, and this has been pointed out, this is the very last point, that um, I don't want to be too optimistic about this, but we are extraordinarily dependent on one another, uh, the interdependence point is profound, and the leaders, the le at the leader level, at least in China and the U.S., they are very, very well aware of that, and that's perhaps a good reason for optimism. So that will be my last conclusion. I think the panel has given us a very uh, interesting, provocative, um, uh, if somewhat bleak view of the world. I suspect somewhat realistic, and uh, I hope you will thank them in the usual way. And you can run away, David. Thanks, Mark, for your man of your word, 757. 757, yes. Okay. Thanks, Ian. Thank you.